Hello, hello there, YouTube. Blish Creek Gaming here today. Today we're going to be going over, or I will be presenting the watchmaker argument. This is pretty much uh, fundamentally the classic watchmaker argument, but it does have some modern updates to the some of the outdated science uh, and philosophies, etc. So. I do not want to make this a long video, hopefully about half an hour, because I'm pretty sure that's how long it's going to take. Um, let's go ahead and jump straight into this. Now I would like to let you know, this is a summarized uh, edition. This is not the full edition, trust me, it's going to be like two hours to get the full edition. So let's just go and jump into this. So. Uh, remember, once again, summarized. Imagine walking down a creek and stubbing your foot upon a stone. Where did that stone come from? Out of anger, we ask. Yeah, whatever. It's been there uh, forever or whatnot. Do we just continue to walk and Snapchat selfies until once again we're not paying attention and we stub our foot on an old mechanical watch, a grandpa watch? Okay, well, now where did that come from? Well, actually, we've never seen a watch before. You know, that's for grandpas. We're, we're young peeps, you know. 21st century. What is it? You know, where did it come from? How does it work? Well, now we're curious. The scientist in inside of us is beginning to awaken. Okay, so let's do some observational science. So, you know, we're looking into this and we're like, wow, you know, looks like the gears, once we open up the watch, we see, wow, looks like gears inside are moving the minute hand, which in turn slowly move the hour hand. It seems built around a system of mechanical gears, each with the purpose to move the other. There is a gear or two which we do not know what its purpose is, but we assume it works for the end purpose of the whole watch in some way. There are even certain gears that work together as a mechanism that when you take one out without one, the others wouldn't, wouldn't function, so it must have been formed simultaneously. We wonder if some natural law formed the watch or, even, or if pure chance could have made it, perhaps an intelligence. Well, this new discovery of the watch is interesting for sure. Uh, it is complex like a unique geological formation, but is ordered unlike a geological formation. It has a complex system that is ordered in such a way that each one of the gears have a purpose, and those we don't know, we assume have a purpose. Either way, the ordered complexity of the watch leads us to make inference that the best explanation for the watch is that there was intelligence somewhere at some time that understood its construction and designed its use. Now people will have objections and obviously because of the conclusion but why don't we go ahead and answer some of those objections before they're even presented. We'll, go, we'll do eight of them. So f first one which that's also called a caveat so first one it would not weaken the conclusion if we didn't know how a watch is made because at the moment of observation we ourselves are unable to craft the exact design I mean does one man in a million know how oval frames are made for my lentis for my glasses as an example if we were to discover a cave with drawings of stick figures with spears hunting down buffalo do we know how specifically that drawing was created in either case with less complex design than the watch we do not doubt intelligent design for them and thus raises no doubt in our minds of the existence and agency of the artist whether it is of the human species like bill gates uh, another species in its entirety like little green men the claw or even being of a different nature than us in some respects. <clears throat> Spaghetti monster. So neither does it molest the conclusion if we already knew that the watch was made. For if we show it to be less, it, so if, let me rephrase this, neither does it molest the conclusion if we already knew the watch was made. For if we show it to less educated individuals, almost always the question will arise, who made it? Caveat number two, neither would it weaken the conclusion if sometimes the, uh, if the watch sometimes went wrong or even if it seldom went right. The purpose of the machinery may be evident to us, but we may even observe ac accidental mishaps or degradation or malfunction if we can even account for it. The question here is not, where is the perfect design? As some will confuse, 
but rather is there design at all? Number three, it would neither weaken our conclusion if some gears of the watch appeared not to work for the general effect of the watch. If the watch mount functions by a loss of a gear, a disordered gear, a degain gear, a retarded gear, a disturbed gear, or a stopped gear, no uncertainty would arise within us as to the intentionality of these specific parts. The more complex a machine is, the more likely a complication will arise. Corporations and capitalism certainly knew this, hence the existence of warranty. Secondly, under number three, imagine if we found a, uh, a gear or mechanism within the watch separate to uh, separate from or connected to the other gears or mechanisms yet we did not know its purpose say we determined it had no purpose then the one or a few mechanisms would not hinder the conclusion of all the rest of the gears or mechanisms the indication the indication of design will remain for every single gear or mechanism except this one or few gears of mechanism Caveat number four. Now the ordered complexity of the dozens of gears and several mechanisms governing over the gears, each according to its own sets, etc., could not have been formed by pure chance, that it was one out of a combination of a numerical of a high numerical value. It is simply most likely not the case. I can continue to ask my ex if we can get back together again, but she can just tell me in the words of Katy Perry, we're never getting back together again. Okay, and if I say, what's the chances of me getting with you? And she says, one to a hundred billion. Am I going to say, all right, I've got a chance? No, because practically it's impossible, really. Now, caveat number five. Now, it would not satisfy the objection that a governing principle of order, or natural law, was discovered that gradually arranged the watch into their present form and situation, which did not require intelligent design. In fact, let's say there was an actual mechanical mechanism that selected the best gears and mechanisms for the betterment of each next generation of self-replicating watches, and that is conceivable. Gradual and successive additions with variation, and if we look back into the history of the watch let's say fossilized watches it would ultimately lead back to a common ancestor ancestor of the watch according to how we know this mechanism to work and its abilities we would come to a certain conclusion of a common ancestor it was a watch there may be different variations caused by random mutation but in the end there are different variations of the same thing watches this principle may explain how watches came to be today but does nothing to explain where the overall design stemmed from in its originality. Number six, I would also think that we would be surprised to learn that the actual mechanisms of the watch observed was not at further study contrivance, which is simply evidence of, of skill, to infer the mind behind the watch, but rather the motifs, which is simply a fancy word for art, of the watch deduces contrivance which ultimately therefore induces the mind behind the watch number seven we are certainly not surprised to be informed that the watch was nothing more than the principle of order or of the metallic nature it is a perversion of language to assign any natural laws the efficient operating cause of of every single thing there was a grammatical error so i did make a correction now continuing on a law presupposes an agent for it is only a mode by which an agent proceeds it implies power for it is the order according to which that agent acts it sounds foreign to some but we use the terms all the time like oh the law of universal gravitation the law of animal nature the law of nature in general and such but all in all it applies to natural phenomenon but excludes agency and power or when substituted in place of these number eight it's the final one finally the one who believes in our conclusion by inference would not be troubled if other people criticize him or her that that's all they know that that's all that person knows it doesn't matter because the argument is firmly planted by being the only conclusion left by inference he or she knows enough for the argument to be successful and the argument is firm in and of intelligent design and anything else can be learned in the future either to further firm the argument or to falsify it
That person knows the utility use of the watch, of its subservancy, which is its ability to submit, and its fantastic adaptation for means to an end. These points being known, his or her ignorance in other points, perhaps reasonable doubts concerning other points, etc., does not, in summarized conclusion, affect the certainty of his or her reasoning. The consciousness of knowing little need not beget a distrust of that of which he or she does know. The conclusion holds. So now let's see if there's anything else that we can find that is just like a watch. Boom. Let's see if I can apply the argument. So, the watch may have a metallic nature versus the humanized biological nature, but the two fundamental sameness is in the ordered complexity of both. An unguided mechanism could have formed the watch and the eye, but if it did, then how did the eye f move first, first move if muscles were non-essential for mo the moving and thus not required when as light sensitive cells in the early stages if uh, uh, in our past supposedly since the principle of order need not select them in the first place that seems troublesome if the eye was number two you know if the eye was simply a collection of a few thousand light sensitive cells then why did the homogeneria require the eye to differentiate the colors why did the eye require three layers of the retina with three sets in one section of one part of the retina connecting to the fiber optics which lead to two separate parts of the brain also when did the brain begin growing the eyes since the eyes is simply an extension of the actual brain number three about the eye the retina in the eye contains over 137 million biological electrical connections all within one square inch i mean you try being that electrical engineer i ain't touching that you mess up one thing you mess, you pretty much kind of mess all of it up i mean if we're being real here as modern people like to say let's be real just because you have you can but use a you can assume a principle of order that makes zero percent of an eye to half a percent to one percent to two percent to four percent etc and then eventually you get one percent of the eye in no way means that you actually get 100 percent vision of the eye how can an unguided principle of order lead to such an, an incredibly complex organ or, the, or object that is ordered in such a way that permits, for example, light data interpretation into the brain via the fiber optic cords behind each eye to be properly processed into intelligible information? It actually seems impossible. Well, it may be improbable. But if we're being practical, it's impossible. No, the, another one, number four, if we can observe intelligent design from a telescope and take video onto a personal computer, then why do we not infer the exact same conclusion of the eye? They may be different in natures, biological versus mechanical, but the sameness of which we're arguing for is the same which is ordered complexity they're both complex but they're both ordered the tele the newtonian telescope as you see on the bottom is a light collector just like as the eye is a light detect is a is a light detector may do slightly different things but in the end similar jobs they both convert light into electricity both of them have wires connected to the back of them, which leads to an information processing unit. So even though the two may be different in nature, the sameness of the ordered complexity is the same. I would say that there seems to be an intent of this design that it, it detects light, converts it into electricity, and processes it at a certain unit. So, that suggests intelligence. And if we can suggest that of the Newtonian telescope, why do we not do that of the eye? I mean, if the eye is simply 
as Google <laughs> likes to put it, a wonderful form of electrical engineering, then the question is, if electrical engineering demands and actually requires intelligence, then why do we not assume the same thing of the eye? So the conclusion of the first examination of the watch of its works, construction and movement suggested was that it must have had for the cause and designer an intelligent designer who understood its mechanism and constructed its use. Even if the watch self-replicated and each new generation of watches had variations and perhaps even adaptations to its environments respectively, it is still it is a perceived systematic mechanism or organization that appears separately calculated for the actual betterment of the watches so we marvel at the design of the mind behind it and we actually have further reverence for the for the mind behind the design now however there are those who see and witness the marvelous ordered complexity of the watch and see how it is designed they see a telescope a machinery of rudimentary design and conclude intelligent design but observe the eye a hundred million times at minimum more in complexity yet ordered for a purpose to see a similar purpose to the telescope and it contains the marks of contrivance and the suggestion of intent and but they conclude that instead of intelligent design that a principle of order gradually created the eye and blatantly deny the intelligent design which is evident to not just us as we now conclude but to them that there is no evidence of skilled construction or arts but that it was unguided design by a principle of order which requires informational input by agency for the power to work in the first place remember it's a perversion of language so how can this absurdity be held by them? But as Paley says, yet this is atheism. Now he also uses astronomy, but it's he goes too much into detail, and this is a summarization. So uh, from and from astronomy, uh, if an object breaks apart in a frictionless environment, then the fragments will all spin the same direction. This is the conservation of angular momentum. So if the conservation of angular momentum is now understood and the hot big bang theory is un understood to be correct to the best of our knowledge, then why do two planets in our solar system spin backwards? If the big bang theory is true and it is unguided rather than guided, then why do two planets spin backwards why do they not spin clockwise with the rest of the planets in the Sun question maybe they have a purpose the next one is the law of centripetal force means that an object will stay in velocity in a straight line unless an external force acts upon it if I shot a bullet parallel to the earth relative to where I am shooting into space then it would continue straight but gravity pulls the bullet to the earth and I hit bullseye. So if I shot at a certain direction away from the earth with enough force, boom, it'll continue forever. If I shoot at a certain angle with a certain amount of force, then it will circle in orbit the earth indefinitely until an external force acts upon it. This is the principle of order which governs the heavenly bodies as well as the earth which the mind who created life could have also created the order which formed the deterministic solar system like a watch and in fact just like how the eye is very much like a watch it's very complex yet ordered uh, different th uh, different gears so to speak uh, vaguely in the eye work just like the watch this very complex 137 million Elect biological electrical connections yet all work for the purpose of seeing just like the watch is used for the purpose to tell time would we not assume then that the solar system being deterministic like a watch ha is ha shows evidence of intelligence design that it has the marks of contrivance that the solar system is put together in such a way where 
the earth is in the Goldilocks zone around just you know it's just in the right place at the right time in the history of the universe at just the right with just the right Sun and just the right place in the galaxy and just the right place in the galaxy clusters just the right place in the whole universe where we can have life maybe there's life on other planets but until we know for certain we're all without we actually know for certain wouldn't that suggest intelligent design I'm pretty sure it does so considering that Newton assumed the existence of a maker of life and of the universe he assumed that there would be constant laws of nature and discover the laws as the Bible says ordinances of heaven and earth the first second and third Newtonian laws would suggest by their simplicity of such great order that there was regulation well actually I would go further and say that there is regulation of the solar system of the, of the you know universal gravi the law of universal gravitation that it's all regulated that gravity is just right for us to jump up and just go straight down not too hard where we into a pancake but not to we don't jump so much and we're off to the stars in a literal sense but it regulates not just us here on earth but the earth itself in relation to the distance to the Sun in relation to the distance of other planets using the inverse square law that we're going around just perfectly which benefits however unfair it may you may seem it be just us as a planet which therefore benefits us as a species that regulation suggests an intention an intention to make this planet inhabitable for us which in turn su suggests choice which only comes from a mind that a mind made the choice to have the intent to regulate via physical laws of nature thus the wonderful order of the constant laws of the heavenly bodies allows us to infer like a watch that it was not pure chance that a tornado came and made the watch or that it just uh, that the whole universe is out of nowhere and everything is exactly the way it needed to be for li living in intelligent life to be abundant and thriving nor any unguided principle of order over the universe but an intelligent designer of the entire universe all space time and matter but wait there's more <laughs> Billy Mays here so some will still object actually asking wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute okay I understand where you're coming from I understand the physical evidence but here's the problem how do we actually know how do we actually detect intelligent design well that's a good question thank you for asking how do we know that a dam was formed by beavers or was it by a flood flinging trees into the river observational evidence is required to know intelligent design we have to observe observational evidence from an object which we deduce intelligent design and then we must compare the marks of contrivance and indications of intent from that which we know is designed to what we are attempting to figure out if it has intelligent design or not however that's what we've that's what we've done we've done just that we made the benefit of the doubt of the watch in the beginning that it could have been formed by natural processes or pure chance but we came to the conclusion that the watch was the product of intelligent design so we look at the watch and we take the marks of contrivance and the indications of intent that we see in the watch that we know are intelligently designed that appears in the watch and then we apply it and see if that if the same marks and indications that are in the watch can be found in the eye or in the solar system or the universe etc so we've done just that but wait Billy Mays here there's more <laughs> they may actually present one more objection actually asking okay good answer but how can we actually detect intentionality actually this is an even better question once again I would say a great question you know was a stone made rectangular by erosion and time or by intelligence 
for example, to be a hammer? Great question. Once again, once again, I emphasize, we must compare objects that we know have within them intent by intelligent design and see if there was any purpose for specific parts of the object in question that may have intent in the sense of similarity. That is, are the intentionality of things we know are designed appear in the same or different forms in the object in question? That's what we've done. Like how the watch has gears to move each other could not have been formed gradually uh, because then the principle of order would not would have no need to select the smaller gear which accidentally grew larger each generation to make the large gear moved by the small gears as a mechanism to move the minute hand. It just can't be done. It's improbable. Essentially, by practicality, impossible. They must have had to have been formed simultaneously. And that, ladies and gentlemen, suggests intelligence. Just like how we see in the watch, there's ordered regulation, even if it's... So, it's complex, yes. But even na print, print, natural laws can create something complex. But can it create something that's ordered? But via experiential knowledge, we know only things that have intelligence can take complexity and make it ordered. make And put it into order. Regulation, as we said. And... You know, yeah, a mind has to have the intent to make regulation, to put order into anything that's to make anything complex into order, put it in order. So, when we see the watch, it is complex and it has gears, but we see that the complexity has been put into order by via uh, self-regulation. For uh, just as an example. And then we can apply the same thing for the eye. It is complex, you know, it does have 137 million biological electrical connections, but one, but DNA in there has self-regulation that if one cell dies, another replaces it. It recycles itself. Self-regulation. It has the regulation that the watch has. Is. And remember, we compare objects that we know that have intent, like we see in the watch, and see if there's any intent in the object in question, which is the eye. And it does. Same thing in the solar system. The law of universal gravitation and the inverse square law ensures that the Earth is in the Goldilocks zone. And that would suggest because it is deterministic, just like the watch, exactly like the watch, I wouldn't say like, but exactly like the watch, regulation. And as we said previously, regulation goes to intent, intent goes to choice, choice comes from mind. So the conclusion, I would say, certainly holds. But if life has a life maker, then who is it? So now that we now that the conclusion is firm and defended, we may identify if we can who the mind was, if it even still exists. Firstly, in the philosophers and of the scientists, they use speech like principles of nature and principles of order to admit design and express efficacy, but to exclude intelligence behind efficacy and agency. Efficacy, if those who don't know, is simply uh, the ability to to produce a desired effect. Now, we can infer that the intelligent designer of life was a person. A person in the sense that, via experiential knowledge, intelligence is derived only from mind, and mind must have a personality, which only applies to persons. Now, if the intelligent designer also must be omnipotent, because, you know, we want to find out, can we find out the qualities of it? Sure, if we use ontology and some philosophy training sure uh, it has to be omnipotent all-powerful omnipotent in the sense that it has more power than we can possibly imagine the power to create uh, the power to create the law of universal gravitation the law to uh, in to place the inverse square law the power to create life the power to create time space matter to to properly and accurately write a new genome and to even create one in the first place and that leads directly to the second. If it has the power to do all that, it has to have the knowledge of how to do that. Omniscience in, in, omniscient in the sense that it must contain more knowledge than we could ever possibly imagine. The knowledge to do 
you know, create life from scratch, write new genomes, set up autonomous defense systems, how to enforce the law of gravita universal gravitation, the inverse square law, uh, to keep the Earth in the Goldilocks zone, how to uh, put the muscles onto the eye, how to set up the 137, over 137 million biological uh, connections, how to make the proteins uh, go together. Instead of doing it constantly with every new life, make a s regulated system like I don't know DNA a biological code that has self-replication this protein goes with this protein which makes this you know or this acid goes with this acid which makes the protein this protein goes with this protein which makes this which goes to this which goes to this which goes to that but not this has to go here but not there which ultimately self-regulates itself because it has been told it has been told to self-regulate itself in a literal sense because that's all what code is now it also must be good and this is probably one of the most controversial ones why well I'll tell you why it has to be good in the sense that it created creatures self-aware to know that they're alive take the story of Adam and Eve for example have a conscious which permits free will to do to do whatever we want and the sense to detect this designer for example um, philosophers have said we shouldn't call humans homo sapiens the wise man but rather homo religiosus because people have an innate sense of a divine which is called sensus divinitatus the vast majority of the population of the earth is actually religious in some sense or another they have a sense that uh, of the divine that there has to be some divine being uh, in governance over the universe because that's just our intuition and someone had actually said that maybe God maybe uh, actually we'll get to it later so, so and the third one is uh, and to be able to uh, sense a basic form of morality for example thou shalt not commit murder thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not steal thou shalt not commit testify falsely in a court of law I say those from the Ten Commandments because even though they're in the Ten Commandments every single culture uh, on the earth currently has a consensus that the negations of these are bad but if we assume they're bad then we must assume that thou shall not commit murder etc is good that not doing them is good and that the negations of these are bad so now we have the idea of bad and good from what external reference because if there's no external reference just our opinion how do you know that a line is zigzagged unless you have an idea of the straight line now you don't have to have the exact knowledge of what a straight line is but all you have to know is an idea and then you can have the idea that a zigzag line is not straight so let's continue now uh, actually going back to this uh, I have had a comment where someone told me that um, maybe God doesn't exist. Maybe, in fact, that, well, actually, he, which I later found that he got this from Matt Dillon, honey, that maybe this God just uh, had a death throw and created the universe. Maybe he's just not here now because he, even though he designed it, doesn't matter if it's designed or not the universe. The watchmaker God is dead. You know, he's not here. Well, I would say first off that I would I believe definitely believe in the Bible but you would have to find that out for yourself if it's true because if Jesus did come into history and he did and claimed all the things he did well then and really resurrected from the dead then the only contention is did he resurrect from the dead because if he did then he did claim to be God and if he did claim to be God and he was resurrected from the dead, that means that the watchmaker God is not dead and seems to like to intervene with his watches. So, uh, but yeah, uh, a second thing was that someone had said that maybe the reason God is so hidden from the world is because uh, the reason we're atheists is because we ourselves, and this comes from Alvin Plantica, you know, we ourselves uh, are atheists because God has made himself so hidden. And it's true, you know, God has made himself hidden in a quite slight, in definitely quite a degree. 
But he left us with the sensus divinitatis, the sense of the divine, a moral conscious, etc. To allow us to sense that there is a divine being that created everything, that there is a watchmaker God, so to speak. And so instead of saying that maybe it's, uh, maybe it's theism that's got it wrong because uh, atheism has got it right, uh, because they can think for themselves well maybe then you can think of a consensus that if the vast vast majority of people are religious and have the sensus divinitatus um, then maybe it's actually atheism that has a cognitive deficiency because they don't have the sensus divinitatus or maybe if they do they just simply deny it well then and they're not looking into it then that just makes them I would say willfully ignorant unless they're truly looking into it then they just haven't gone to the right sources let's go and continue because what this concludes is immense it does not take lightly on those who resisted the argument in the first place and even on those who still reject the, arg the argument's conclusion not because of the physical evidence of which they themselves may review nor of the argument's logical strength which Charles Darwin himself to use in the inference the best explanation but of their volition they desire it not to be true they don't want it to be true they don't want there to be this watchmaker being or watchmaker God as the argument concludes they set up mental walls to forbid such a conclusion to be true that there was and perhaps quite still is at this time as the Bible says still alive an all-powerful all-knowing good intelligent designer of life and by induction the universe qualities most similar to the God of the Christians or if you want to generalize it what everyone calls God now let me actually explain why it is the Christian God because people will say wait a minute this argument is very vague doesn't prove any specific God well William Paley, in his book, if you've read the last few chapters, begs to differ sev severely. And so would I. Well, first off, let me let me go ahead and present my case, just very shortly. So, uh, and this is going to be a very short case, because we don't have too much time. So the Bible states, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. As Ken Hovind stated, the God of the Bible is not affected by time, space, or matter. Because someone had asked him, if, okay, well, if there is a watchmaker God, who uh who regulates the universe then who who reg who made god so essentially god made everything who made god so this is what he said the god of the bible is not affected by time space or matter time space and matter is what we call a continuum all of them have to come into existence at the same time if there was matter but no space where would you put it if there was matter and space but no time when would you put it you cannot have time space or matter independently they have to come into the existence simultaneously the bible answers that in 10 words in the beginning there's time god created the heaven there's space and the earth that's matter there you have to have time space and matter trinity trinities father son spirit holy spirit time is past present future space has length with height matter has solid liquid gas the god who created them has to be outside of them and i would like to make a side note as well uh, once is an accident twice is a coincidence thrice is a purpose continuing on if he is limited by time space or matter he is not god the guy who created this computer is not in the computer. He's not running around changing the numbers on the screen, okay? The God who created this universe is outside of this universe, above it, beyond it, in it, through it. He's unaffected by it. If the concept that, as other people say, that the spiritual force cannot have any effect on the material body, that only begs the question of why then, I'd guess you have to explain to me things like emotions, hatred, envy, jealousy, and even rationality itself. You can say all you want that you're a cosmic skeptic because rationality rules. But if your brain is just a random collection of chemicals formed by chance over billions of years and that you believe that objective matter created subjective mind, then how on earth can you trust your own reasoning processes and the thoughts you, th you think? You just can't deal with the truth. Kantian joke there. Now the question of where did God come from assumes a limited God and the Christian God simply isn't limited. Which leads us to the conclusion, therefore, therefore, the Christian God exists. As Sir Arthur Conan Doyle once said, once you have eliminated the impossible, or once you've eliminated all other possibilities, whatever remains, no matter how improbable or how much you may hate the conclusion, it must be the truth.
the Christian God exists. And so if the Christian God exists, then that makes Jesus' claims only that much more credible and his resurrection that much more believable and acceptable. So since the Christian God exists, and we've shown this via this argument, if you died a day, do you know where you would be 10,000 years from now? Would you be in heaven or hell? For, so if you want to answer that question, first ask yourself if you've ever committed a sin, which is a spiritual crime against God. We'll look only at three of the Ten Commandments today. Have you stolen anything at any time in your life? Number one. Have you ever lied even once at all in any time in your life? Number two. Have you ever looked at a woman or a man with lust? Number three. Jesus says that if you look at a woman with lust, I tell you you've already committed adultery in your heart. And the same applies vice versa. If you've said yes to, to any of these, then by your own confession, you are a lying, thieving, adulterer at heart. If you were to die right now, unfortunate as would be, before you finish watching this video and you were to be presented before God the Father in his heavenly court and he opens a book which states that you are a lying, thieving, adulterer at heart, a criminal in the eyes of God, would you be sentenced as not guilty? No. God is a righteous judge. No matter how much he may love you, he must enforce the, in, he must enforce the law which he himself wrote and condemn you to hell, eternal separation from him. Imagine, however, that your lawyer finally walks in at the last moment and argues your case, saying, Objection, Your Honor! This man or woman gave, gave his or her life to me. He or she is a part of my family, and the blood that I shed on that cross at that time covers his or her sins. Look in the book again. The Most Holy Righteous Judge of Heaven opens the Book of Life once again, which contains all the records of your sins, and sees where the where page is full is now blank. It looks again, still blank. Turns a couple pages, still blank. The most honorable judge states to the lawyer Jesus, It appears you are correct. I can find no record of any sin. Congratulations, the defendant is hereby acquitted of all charges. You are free to go. Boom. Your one-way ticket to heaven. The Bible states clearly how you can know if you are saved. If you're worried, it states, quote, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God the Father raised him from the dead or grave, then you will be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Give your life to Christ. I strongly urge you today by tonight rather than by tomorrow or next year and die before you have accepted him. And be satisfied in your heart where you will end up a thousand years from now. Now, if you truly do want to be saved, then if you don't know what to say to God to be saved, then let me offer a short prayer. You can modify it to yourself after this if you don't want to repeat after me, it's okay, since it's you talking to God personally. Even if he doesn't respond, know that he is listening. You can repeat after me if you would like. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I know that you died for me on the cross, and I believe that you rose from the dead. I ask of you to save me. Come into my heart, and please forgive me of my sins right now. I recognize you as Lord, and accept you as my Savior. Amen. Well, if you pray, pray that prayer, congratulations. I then truly believe if you pray that prayer earnestly, that you have been saved. If I were you, I'd mark this date as your second birthday because now you've been spiritually born again. You are technically now my brother or sister in Christ. Welcome to the family. Now, getting born again takes less than a few minutes, sure, but growing takes a long time. The way you grow as a new Christian is to read your Bible first off, go to church, witness to people, etc. You know, let people know that you're Christian and let people know that why they should be Christians too, etc. They don't make you a Christian, but they help you grow as one. And in all honesty, that's all I actually have to say for today. So I hope that this has truly impacted your life and that you truly understand a, you have an even more better, let me rephrase that, that you have an even better idea of the classic watchmaker argument. And if you do accept this conclusion like I do, then 
and then I would strongly suggest give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you did pray that prayer, prayer with me and you did do it earnestly, welcome to the family. It is time to it's time for you to get off this computer after this video, go celebrate that you now have eternal life. I love every single one of you. God bless you all and peace be with you. Yeah, that's all, folks.